and um, uh, welcome to our latest uh, uh, Gastro Learning uh, Live event. Um, I'm George Webster. It gives me huge uh, pleasure to um, uh, welcome Professor uh, Ian Brownick, from, uh, who's Professor of Gastroenterology at Haifa in Israel, and also the President-elect of uh, uh, ESGE. Um, uh, so a busy man, uh, Ian, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here today for us to uh, focus down together on the question of the endoscopic management of uh, um, non baroseal bleeding. Uh, one of those clinical problems that almost all of us involved in endoscopy uh, deal with, um, uh, usually in the times of the day or the times of the night that we would uh, uh, rather we weren't. Um, and, um, you know, it isn't one of those problems that we can intensively build experience up uh, over, you know, doing three lists a week, um, uh, you know, over a few months. Um, and as a result, I think all of us are never quite sure um, how we should be going about it um, and what the evidence is to, to support what we do. Um, so it's great to have you, um, uh, have you with us. Um, we're going to focus particularly on um, ulcer-related bleeding, although we may touch on other, uh, other causes of upper uh, GI bleeding. Um, okay. um, and before we get on to the, the um, endoscopic uh, technicalities, if you like, um, just give us a, some, some background. Um, one of the, the most common questions is, you know, when should we be getting out of bed? What should be the timing of um, uh, the endoscopies that we do? Um, you know, what should be the role of uh, pre-procedure uh, PPIs? So just would value your comments on, on those two topics just to get going. Sure, well, first I wanna say good evening to you and to everybody who's listening. Uh, it's a real uh, honor and a pleasure for me to be here. So I really appreciate the invite to be here. And I really like the intro music. So it was really cool. Um, okay, so talk about timing. Uh, if you really look at the, the latest guidelines and updates we published from the ESGE uh, really one year ago, an update to our 2015 guidelines on non variceal upper GI bleeding. The American College of Gastroenterology a couple months later came up with an update as well. Uh, the takeaway message here is that really most all patients should be endoscope within 24 hours of the time that they present. Not the time that they get admitted, but it really should be from the time that, that, that they hit the door at the emergency department. Um, there have been studies, uh, the real big study was published uh, last year by James Lau, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which really showed that there was no benefit in terms of rebleeding or mortality at 30 days. And those patients who had really upfront early endoscopy. So within six hours of the time of, of uh, at their definition was hospital admission or within six to 24 hours. Uh, and in the guidelines that we published a year ago, our update, we really said that uh, there's no real benefit to scoping patients earlier than 12 hours. And we really do not recommend scoping within six hours because there's data to show that actually it could be detrimental to the patient. They could have adverse outcomes. The big important thing to remember is you need to hemodynamically resuscitate these patients. You need to get all your ducts lined up before you drop the endoscope. If you want to hear about PPIs up front, uh, we know the data really shows that it um, can reduce the likelihood when we scope patients, if we give them an upfront IV PPI, uh, that it may reduce the likelihood of me finding a uh, uh, significant stigmata of, of recent bleeding, endoscopic stigmata. But if you look at the clinically relevant outcomes, such as mortality, rebleeding, need for surgery, it really doesn't affect that. So we sort of throttled back a little bit uh, and we followed suit what, what you Brits have done, Keith Seau published on this, the Asian Pacific Group published on this, um, that really uh, we suggest considering the use of an IV PPI up front before endoscopy in those patients where we're suspecting uh, a non seal upper GI source of hemorrhage. Okay, and, and what about what about other pharmacology? You know, quite often the patient will come in with a bleed into the emergency room, and other teams may have 
you know, when they refer the patient, say, oh, we've started tranexamic acid, you know, a view on tranexamic, tranexamic acid. Also, as we're preparing the endoscopy, um, a, a view on, you know, clearing the gut, clearing the, the stomach, prokinetic agents. So, so I, I get asked this question. So there's no role for things like somatostatin that can assist you in these types of patients. Uh, there is uh, no, we've, there's now, there's a the big study, the halted study was a randomized trial, very large study looking at tranexamic acid. It's an anti-fibrinolytic agent that's used in trauma uh, and other sources of bleeding. People thought, well, maybe could this be helpful in GI bleeding? The answer is no. Uh, the, the study showed that there was no significant difference in terms of uh, GI bleeding effects of transexamic acid or on mortality. There's actually, it appeared that there actually may be more adverse outcomes in the group of patients who were randomized to transexamic acid, specifically more venous events. There were significantly higher DVTs and uh, uh, thromboembolism in the patients who uh, received the uh, transexamic acid. So in the guideline, the ESG guideline, we say, no, there's no role for that, that here. What's the role of, what the role of a potential promotility agent? So the data has largely been looked at uh, using IV erythromycin given as a single dose, 250 milligrams, about anywhere from maybe 60 to 120 minutes before you wanna put down the scope. Uh, and uh, there's data to show that it can be helpful in patients who we think may have residual blood and clot in the upper GI tract because it's going to clear that blood out. And it shows that we can actually visualize better, okay? And we probably don't need to do second follow-up endoscopies because we get a good look at that initial endoscopy. But again, here in terms of clinically relevant outcomes, it probably doesn't necessarily matter. I, I like to use it. I tend to use it. Uh, if you don't have erythromycin, you can try and use something like metoclopramide, but the vast majority of data that we have has really been looking at erythromycin. Okay. And can I just ask about um, uh, anesthetic support? Um, you know, is that something that in your unit you, you have available and you would, would push for as a as standard for, for mm -hmm. upper GI non baroseal bleeding, or are you, you, you're, you're comfortable with intravenous? sedation? Um, we, we uncommonly have to uh, get anesthesia support. In those patients that we feel we need to, if they have other significant comorbidities, my recommendation, if you're doing these cases, especially after hours, we will request the OR that they'll, they'll do this with us in the OR and get anesthesia support. If we're looking specifically at patients who may need to be prophylactically intubated, to protect the airway, it's not routine. There's no data to support, support routine intubation before uh, endoscopy. There are selected patients where it may be helpful. It's more common in the patients who may be bleeding from varices, and yep. if they're encephalopathic and they can't control their airway, uh, or in patients who are really having ongoing active hematemesis, which you're worried about, those types of patients I would, I would prophylactically intubate, but the, but the takeaway message here is once you're done with them, take out the tube, okay? You don't wanna leave it in, in for a long period of time. It's really there just to protect the airway. Yeah, okay, that, that, that's very helpful. Um, great, let, let's do modalities should perhaps be, and some, some of the tricks and tips around, you know, how we should use them. Um, sure. Uh, uh, you know, do you have an initial go-to um, uh, intervention endoscopically with a, with a let's say, a, um, you know, a forest 1A, 1B uh, bleeding ulcer? You know, what, um, you, you know, what techniques do you go from the outset with? So if it's really, you know, if it's a 1A and it's really uh, actively bleeding, so pulsatile spurting type bleeding, um, I would really go with what the guidelines are saying, that these patients need combination therapy. What's combination therapy? So you're going to want to pre-inject uh, with dilute epinephrine, dilute adrenaline, usually 1 to 10,000 dilution. Some places will use 1 to 20,000 dilution. Uh, and it can give you a tamponade effect and even a vasoconstrictive effect. And you want to inject around the area. Do not inject into the exact site of bleeding. I've seen it happen before where they shoot up their pulse to over 200 because of that. Um, you don't wanna do that. So you inject around the area, 
about one to two cc's per injection. It's going to either slow the bleeding down or stop it. It's going to allow you to clean up that area, visualize the exact site of bleeding, and then you're going to follow up your injection with a second modality. So probably the most common modality used today would be a through the scope clip, but I'm still old school. I still like to use a contact thermal devices such as uh, gold probes, you know, bipolar probes or heater probes. Or today, what's becoming more and more common is also to use uh, uh, cat mounted clips like an over the scope clip by Ovesco or the padlock uh, is another clip. But the vast majority of the data we have is really an over the scope clip. So I think everybody's seen there's this actively bleeding ulcer. So this is a Forest 1A, it's a pulsatile uh, uh, arterial bleeding. And you're gonna see really what I'm gonna do here is going to inject around this area uh, just with an injector needle, and it's going to end up slowing down. It's going to actually, I think, stop this active bleeding, which we'll hopefully see here in a moment or two. So here comes the injector needle, and we're going to inject around this area, one to two cc's per injection. And that really usually does the job. Just injecting epinephrine, George, as you know, is not enough. That is not definitive therapy. And yep. we should no longer be doing that because there's a very high rebleeding rate when the adrenaline or the epinephrine dissipates and disappears. So now we've stopped this bleeding or we've gotten it down to a little bit of an ooze. And now this is a through the scope clip. We're going to go right over that area and we're going to place a clip right on there. You can put one clip. If you, if you need to put one or two more, that's fine. But you want to compress that underlying vessel that's feeding that ulcer and that was doing the bleeding. Great. And, and um, you know, very nice sequence there you showed in that case. Do you ever, you know, see a, a clearly exposed bleeding vessel and go for the clip first? Or you do you as an absolute standard, um, you know, go for the epinephrine first? You know, I, I, I think that if it's sort of oozing and you have a good, uh, you have good visualization and you're able to put your scope in the right place where you have the right angle and and now with rotatable uh, clips, it's also a little bit easier. You can try and close it like that. What I would do in that situation is I actually will close and hold it there. Don't fire the clip yet, that yet. You hold it there and you'll actually see if you're really compressing and tamponading that vessel. Once you feel good about that initial uh, clip placement, then I'll tell the nurse fire. They fire the clip. You can add some clips around there if you feel you need to. So listen. Uh, guidelines are for guidance and it's oftentimes black and white. In reality, as we know, it's not always black and white. If I feel I really don't have good access and there's a lot of blood and it's bleeding, I'm going to inject beforehand because I think it's very helpful and the data supports that. And, and ever a problem with a, a slightly fibrotic uh, ulcer base in which you the, the standard endoscopic clips you just can't get, can't get traction on or... or you know, any advice or is that a scenario that you recognize? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I think we'll also probably see a video, I, I hope here. Um, that's where I think today more and more we're using uh, the over the scope clip. Uh, okay. in, in these larger fibrotic lesions where the, you see here, this is a, a good example. This was, this is actually a video from my colleague, Marine Camus from uh, Paris, France. She had this very large duodenal ulcer. You see that she had tried to stop it with injection. There was uh, some through the scope clips that are there and this thing just wouldn't stop. And uh, using the over the scope clip and we're seeing this is really placed onto the scope, very, very similar to a band ligating device. Very same principle. Uh, we sort of have the fish wire or fish string, uh, like I call it through that you feed through uh, and you place the uh, clear cap over the scope and the clear cap has the night and all a clip as we see here. Uh, some people have called it a bear claw. And you see then she can go down and because this is much bigger, grabs a larger amount of tissue, uh, you're able to localize the site of bleeding. You can suction that area into the, the, the clear housing and then you deploy uh, just by turning the flywheel, very similar to a band ligating device. And it grabs a very large hunk of tissue and actually is able to grab the underlying uh, vessel as well and stop the bleeding. We'll see here once she places this, you'll see that the bleeding has stopped and you actually can see the sort of bear claw appearance of, of this uh, over the scope clip that's left behind. We'll see it here in a second. Very nice. 
but, but what we're using these, we are using these more and more. And if you look at what the guidelines say, uh, at least the ones that the, the ESG has published, is that and there's now data to support it. There are two randomized trials. One has looked at recurrent bleeding. We believe in patients where we've stopped the bleeding and they have recurrent bleeding from their ulcer. This is actually to the go-to uh, modality to be used. And now just last month or two months ago, the Jensen Group at UCLA published a prospective randomized trial looking at over the scope clip as a initial first line therapy. And it was significantly better in terms of preventing re-bleeding as compared to through the scope clips uh, as well as thermal uh, uh, contact coagulation devices. Um, great, there's, a, there's a, uh, a great question come through from Evo Clarin. Um, uh, do you always use transparent caps uh, when scoping a, a bleeding patient? Yeah, good question. Yes. Oh, you I mean just like just a, a cap to put on without any type of a clip or something like that? Uh, yeah. I assume. Um, no, I don't. Not, not regularly. Uh, if I find that I, it may be beneficial, it may be more beneficial really for the lower GI bleeders, okay, where you're looking around folds and maybe a uh, diverticular type bleed. But generally in upper bleeders, I don't generally do it unless I feel there may be in a funny angle within the duodenum or between the duodenal bulb and the second portion where it may be helpful to be able to push back a fold. You can pull out your scope and put a clear cap on, but I don't routinely go down with a cap on. Okay, and you made the, you made the analogy between the variceal banding kit and the OTSC uh, kit. Now clearly, you know, we teach our, our, our fellows and our trainees that when you're using a, a banding kit, that you have to be sure that you've sucked the tissue into the, the cap such that you get a red out in order to get the clip, to, in order to get the band to deploy. Are you less, presumably you're less obsessed about the amount yeah. of tissue you suck in when, when using the OTSC? Yeah, it is. It's, it's not the exact same. And even with OTSC, uh, generally with bleeders, you probably don't do this as much as there also, you know, is a, a, uh, a forceps that you can put through the working channel and even grab tissue uh, and sort of pull it in if you can't necessarily suction it in. Usually suctioning will, will help. And I try and do suction rather than trying to pull tissue in. Uh, but yeah, it's not the same thing where you have to have this complete red out like with variceal bleeding. And, and again, with the OTSC, do you do you need to have a, um, a degree of normal non-ulcer and certainly non-ulcer-based tissue in order to confidently use the OTSC clip or, or even a big, wide-based ulcer, you're still reasonably confident about using it in that setting? Exactly, because it's more in that, like, you know, like what we saw in the video, you're literally, there's this huge ulcer that's very fibrotic and you had to go right to the site of where that vessel was and it wasn't wasn't on the edge or anything so in that situation you have to go for right the, the site of the bleeding suction it in and deploy the clip okay great now 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 one of the sort of uh well not that not that new kid on the block but certainly over the last uh uh you know five uh five or six years um we've got excited about uh powders and sprays um to the extent that uh, perhaps sometimes they're, they're viewed as the answer to uh, all the world's troubles, um, and certainly in the setting of an upper GI bleed. Um, where do you see that these, uh, these powders sit um, in, in the management of non variceal bleeding? So, I, you know, I think, and again, if you look at what the guidelines are currently recommending, and if we're talking specifically about peptic ulcer bleeding, it really should be a rescue therapy or a salvage therapy. So if you really can't get things stopped uh, and you need to sort of have some type of a bridge and get things cooled down, you can put something like hemospray on there. Potentially now the new kit is, is next powder uh, that you could consider using. Um, I think the place where topical sprays may have a primary role and um, where there's actually relatively decent data for this uh, is with those patients who are having some type of a uh, upper GI tumor bleed. So these tumors can be large and they sort of have diffuse oozing because of angiogenesis and, and they're really not amendable to being treated with 
thermal devices or through the scope clips or over the scope clips usually. So it's sort of this diffuse ooze. In those situations, I think that again, you're using it as a bridge to definitive therapy, but if you put spray on these types of things, there's data to show it can be, it can be very helpful. The other situation to be very honest with you, George, is there may be people who just don't see a lot of bleeders. They may, uh, may be outside of a large metropolitan area and before they transfer somebody to maybe a center that has more experience, you know, it would be a place where they need to throw some powder on there to try and make sure things are stopped. Now with chemo spray, you really need to have active oozing or bleeding. Otherwise it's not going to really necessarily work. Uh, there's some data that may show that with next powder, you don't need active bleeding. I think it's too early to, to see if that's really definitively true. Okay. And in fact, we've got some, We've got some tutorials and, and uh, uh, teaching videos on the gastro learning site for people who want to see about uh, uh, deploying those uh, deploying those powders. Um, and you know, I, I have seen um, hemospray used almost as a diagnostic tool. Um, you know, there's blood everywhere. Let's spray some hemospray and let's keep an eye where the heralds bleed, where the the blood starts coming through. Do you think that? almost literally muddies the waters, or do you think that has any sort of role? I, I don't do that. I don't think it's a great idea to do that, to be honest with you. Uh, I think you're right. It sort of blood, it mud, muddies the, the water. Muddies. Yeah, uh, yeah it, it's, it's, it can be, I think it can cause more problems than good. I think in those situations, you really need to just be patient, you need to try and suction, clean. Um, you know, I, I personally think that in these types of bleeders, we should we should be using only at least a single large channel gastroscope or better yet, if you have it, we don't, a double channel upper GI scope. Uh, and the reason is, is be able to wash and suction better. Most of the time you're gonna be able to find where they're bleeding from. Great. Now, um, you know, we all like to, to turn to guidelines and, and, and rely on guidelines. There's one bit of advice that, that seems so counterintuitive that that uh, endoscopists have always been nervous about. And that is the advice about what to do about an adherent clot. You know, from medical school, we know that if you're bleeding, you get a clot, clot is good. And yet um, in endoscopy, uh, in the setting of bleeding, we're told, oh no, if there's a clot there, you wanna get rid of it. So tell us, tell us your view about adherent clots. So, um, so there's no consensus, right? There's no consensus. There was, there was a meta-analysis probably 20 years ago that on the limited data that was out there that showed maybe treat, removing the clot and treating the underlying stigmata may be beneficial. I, I think the, the issue here is that there's also data to show that putting these patients on high dose IV PPIs may also be as well, which will continue to stabilize the clot. Uh, my, my, my advice is generally, you know, this can be like swatting a bee's nest. And if you're not prepared to deal with the bees coming out, meaning the blood, uh, you probably may be better off leaving it, putting them a high dose uh, IV PPI. Um, I, I think that if you're going to treat it, you need to do it the right way. And, uh, and the right way, and we're seeing, a, there's a video here, this is a large uh, uh, antral ulceration. We see this uh, adherent clot that's here. Um, and, and what you really want to do is before you start playing with the clot, whether you want to suction off the clot or take it off with a little mini snare, you need to do what's being done here is you need to pre-inject with the, with the dilute epinephrine again. So one to 10,000, one to 20,000 in four quadrants around this area. And again, it's the same reason you want to try and uh, prevent potential inducing bleeding when you go to take that clot off. The data will show that when you take clot off, you're probably going to find at least probably two thirds to three quarters of the time, uh, either you're going to induce bleeding or it'll start to ooze or bleed, or you're going to find a, a non-bleed visible vessel underneath there, which you need to treat. So you just need to be, uh, you need to be ready to treat. If you're going to do it, you need to do it the right way. So pre-inject, try and take off the clot. And you can see here, this induced a little bit of bleeding here. Uh, and then you follow it up with a second modality, whether that's going to be, again, a thermal contact device, such as a, a bipolar probe or a heater probe, uh, a through the scope clip, or now today, like an over the scope clip. Now, I think this video 
is going to show that this was treated with a contact thermal device. So this is a gold probe. Um, you'd really ideally want to have a little bit better uh, cessation of bleeding here, um, but you're going to see that they can go right over the point where the blood is sort of swirling there and you need to press on this. So this is coaptive coagulation. You're literally trying to, to weld the vessel shut. This is low wattage. So I'll use anywhere from about 15 to 18 uh, uh, watts. And you want to press on that area and you're going to hold it for about eight to 10 seconds, literally pushing on it, holding it down. And you're going to create this, what's called a, a post hemostasis footprint where you flattened out that underlying vessel. Nice, very nice. Um, uh, okay. Um, we, um, we've had a couple of other questions that come through. I know we're not concentrating on variceal bleeding, but there's a question about uh, PPIs in, in, in the setting of variceal bleeding. Um, I don't know what your comment would be, but I, I would just make the point that there's good evidence that um, up to 50% of people with uh, chronic liver disease and portal hypertension who come in with a bleed are bleeding from a non variceal cause of uh, uh, one sort or another. So, um, you know, would you advise the, uh, the, the use of PPIs, um, certainly before a definitive diagnosis of variceal bleeding? I, I think you could consider it, okay? The big thing though, and this we just, we just are, we're gonna come out later this year with the uh, guidelines on variceal bleeding from the ESGE, which I was fortunate enough to lead on that. And, and we're just putting together now the statements. The biggest thing with PPI is if you are gonna give it to somebody with advanced chronic liver disease, you need to stop it if it's not, if, if it's variceal bleeding, because the hepatologists, at least we're on our guideline committee, they don't like PPIs in patients with advanced chronic liver disease. It's very interesting. Uh, and one of the other guidelines to me is, is uh, or statements is that really there's no, there's no good evidence to, put, to support putting patients on PPIs after they've been treated for their variceal bleeding with banding or with uh, glue, things like that. It does not prevent ulcerations or prevent uh, bleeding. Interesting. So that, that's, my, that's my two cents on uh, PPIs and variceal bleeding. And, and we're, we're, uh, we're nearly coming to the end, but um, just a couple more words about, about PPIs. We've, we've all tended to get a bit tied in knots about the um, intravenous PPI regimens and, uh, you know, continuing the, uh, for, for 72 hours. And then uh, have we got some movement on that because organisationally, it's quite a hassle, particularly if the patients, you know, one's got beautiful hemostasis and, you know, uh, a day or two later, the patient is well uh, ready to go home, and yet you're sort of committed to a more prolonged IV regimen uh, of PPIs. Do we need to be doing that? So uh, the current guideline is saying that um, you can put post hemostasis, you can put them on a high dose IV PPI for 72 hours as a continuous infusion. The change has been now, the update is that you now can put them on DID dosing or twice daily bolus dosing of a high dose PPI for 72 hours after their hemostasis. And there's actually some data to show that even high dose oral in selected patients may be efficacious as well. In terms of, do you need to keep them for three days? We don't get into that uh, granularity. Uh, you know, I think it can, depends on a case by case basis. But the bottom line here is at least while they're in the hospital, they should be on a high dose PPIs. And once they're discharged, I will keep them on a high dose uh, PPI orally for at least the next month or six weeks and then go from there. Okay, fantastic. And, 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 don't, and don't forget in peptic ulcers, don't forget to make sure you're checking for helicobacter pylori. And if it's positive, you need to treat it. And you need to make sure the patients come back after treatment to confirm eradication of, of the H. pylori. And you should start their treatment for H. pylori as soon as possible because there's data to show that it, do, it does help in, in healing the ulcers faster and preventing rebleeding. Okay. Um, well, that's a great top tip. Um, we're nearly at the end. Um, and I was going to ask you- This, this, was a, this was a really fast half hour, let me tell you. It's, it's too quick, isn't it? And, and <laughs> It's really it's, quick. Uh, um, but actually that, you know, we're all busy and these, uh, these pearls of wisdom are exactly what we want. So, I mean, actually, do you want to just um, 
go through. We've got a nice list here, but um, the, your, your final top tips would be incredibly helpful. Um, so it, it, everybody can see this. I said earlier, I think we really should be scoping these patients with single large channel or double channel gastroscopes. We all should have water jet capability for washing yeah. uh, through the scope. Uh, if you're going to use contact thermal therapy, I do recommend using the large size probe. And thus, you really need a large single channel or double channel scope. The 10 French probe will not fit through a diagnostic upper scope. Uh, through the scope clips, you're going to use the rotatable ones, of course, that open and close. Rescue therapy with uh, over the scope clips or topical agents and sprays. And I really think, George, today, really in 2022, we need to have 24 7 coverage for these types of cases. And the nurses that are really assisting us really need to be endoscopy nurses. Uh, I'm not an advocate of using the ICU nurse or the cardiac care unit nurse to help us. They're not familiar with these cases. They're not familiar with our equipment. And uh, we really need to have the endoscopy team there to treat these patients off hours. And that's in the guidelines too, by the way. Yep, yep. Well, great. So uh, pearls of clinical wisdom from start to finish, all, all packed into 30 minutes. Um, I, Iron, thanks ever so much. That was, uh, you know, really, really uh, um, clinically relevant and uh, um, lots of great advice. So. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for everybody else for, uh, for being with us. You can review um, this um, Gastro Learning Live back on the, uh, uh, the Gastro Learning site. Um, and uh, have a great evening. Keep, keep safe, everybody, in these difficult times. And Ian, thanks ever so much once sure. again. Thank you. It was great. It was fantastic. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Bye.